And I think it's a very timely meeting that you're having. Uh, timely for you, because 20 years, uh, maybe one of the oldest uh, acupuncture societies that, that exists, that I know of uh, in the Western world. Um, and it's timely for many other ways. Uh, there's an increasing interest in the whole area of complementary medicine worldwide. I think it's a phenomenon that you're seeing throughout Germany, and certainly we're seeing it in the United States. Um, there are uh, approximately a million visits per year in the United States to acupuncturists for all sorts of problems, uh, mainly about pain. And we'll be talking um, quite a bit about that as an overview of the clinical trials shortly. Uh, physicians are becoming more and more interested um, that we've seen. Uh, we did a national survey of primary care physicians in the United States that's going to be published uh, this summer. And the, the, uh, what they consider to be alternative or complementary is changing rapidly. What is becoming more legitimate, what is becoming outside the box is changing. Acupuncture is about in the middle, about 50% of the physicians that we surveyed thought that this was a legitimate part of medical practice and they either used or referred in some ways, which is a big change from uh, previous surveys. And the payers um, are also um, increasingly looking at these therapies to see what they have to offer. Um, I think that also is the same here, but certainly in our country uh, now things like uh, chiropractic manipulation and acupuncture are starting to be covered by insurance companies, uh, not yet by our government, uh, but that probably has changed because they now reclassify needles as non-experimental uh, over the past couple of years. And then there's the uh, government. I want to talk to you a little bit about this background. Gabriel asked ask me to give you sort of a setting of partly what's happening um, in our country as well as in our own program. But uh, the government, certainly one of the most visible, has been the National Institutes of Health, uh, set up an Office of Alternative Medicine, uh, which they first called the Office of Unconventional Therapies. I think it was, it was maybe pretty close to natural unconventional therapies, which I think they were thinking was nuts, NUC, NUTS. Um, but that, that has really given a national focus to this uh, uh, movement um, and for acupuncture it's really made a big difference I think. It's slow but it's really coming along. There was an, a conference with the NIH and the uh, FDA um, a couple of years ago. Uh, that conference, the results of that led to the uh, change in classification of needles from <coughs> being now no longer experimental. And then this November, there was an acupuncture consensus conference uh, that um, I think the, will be published in JAMA. Um, they, they usually publish those uh, conferences. I don't know if you've seen the, uh, the draft of that, but we can make that available to you through uh, your organization. And that conference uh, really changed the way people started to look at these therapies. I mean, overall, it was fairly positive. They did say that the results, the studies, in general were not very good. There were certain pockets, certain areas where there were therapies uh, that had uh, certain diseases that had some evidence to that, but then on a whole, there needed to be a lot more rigorous science applied, but they saw a way forward for that, and that has led to the National Institute of Health uh, putting out a request for applications, um, which goes in in about 10 days' time. Uh, we're applying for that, so uh, I know that date very well. Uh, but they wanted to say, we don't yet know what all the methodological issues are for acupuncture trials, so rather than rushing into huge studies straight away, we will look at how do we improve the methodology, how do we improve the acupuncture, um, what types of acupuncture, and how do we improve the uh, controls that we're using. And so that is, is really things forward that way. But then it's also timely when you See, I don't know if any of you saw uh, Bruce Pomerantz, so I know has spoken here a number of times. Um, he had an article uh, two weeks ago in JAMA, which basically uh, was a very important article. It said that um, pharmaceutical drugs, they did a meta-analysis, uh, uh, and they looked at pharmaceutical drugs, and they looked at side effects only. And they found that it was the sixth highest cause of death of any disease uh, that existed something like 100,000 deaths per year due to the side effects of our medications. And that's an incredible statement that they are making. So when you look at even for all acupuncture and other complementary therapies, and you look at uh, research, what he was saying is that if you could show that these therapies are less toxic, 
safer from that. That's really the battlegrounds that needs to be fought right now, not even counting efficacy. So that's something that's happened. So I thought, with all that, maybe the, the first <coughs> slide is that history of medicine. Back to the roots of short history of medicine for you. I have an earache. 2000 BC, they would say, here, eat this root. 1,000 years later, that root is heathen, say this prayer. 1850, that prayer is superstition, drink this potion. 1940, that potion is snake oil, swallow this pill. 1985, that pill is ineffective, take this antibiotic. And then they come back full circle, 2000, that antibiotic is artificial, here, eat this root. But sometimes things come about full circle, and that's, I think, what's happening in medicine. I think what we're uh, leaning towards is more of an integration of care, an integration of medicine on uh, both sides. So when you get down to it, it's not that one is right and one is wrong. It's really just different views of reality, and both are probably incomplete uh, within their own right. But together, actually give a full picture of what's going on. My own background was, was that I was trained in, in conventional medicine, family medicine, and then in trauma medicine, and um, was discouraged, was, was encouraged by the results of acute medicine. When somebody came in with an acute myocardial infarction or pulmonary edema, we had certain things that we could do, and they seemed to work very well, but it was for chronic diseases that I found that I didn't have many answers, like many of you, I'm sure, um, here have found. And so I started to look for other ways to help my patients, and in particular, um, gravitated towards acupuncture in the early 80s, and then homeopathy um, a few years later in, in London, at the Royal London Homeopathic Hospital, and basically developed a clinic there um, in the early 1980s, where we had uh, acupuncturists, homeopath, osteopath, uh, myself as family physician, and psychiatrists working together and found that we could take care of a wider range of problems more effectively in that kind of interdisciplinary uh, setting. I also found that my colleagues were still pushing me further and further off to the side back then, so the ostracism um, of what we were doing, and that was frustrating, so eventually I convinced uh, one of the foundations there to put up some money, and, and they said yes, as long as we could get uh, matching of funds. Um, which eventually we did from the University of Maryland. We started our center there um, at the School of Medicine back in 1991. And at that time, there wasn't really a focus about complementary medicine in the United States. There really, what I called it complementary medicine, people thought it was complementary with a, spelled with an I, meaning that it was, you know, free. So they would call for their complementary acupuncture treatment. And that wasn't what we were doing. And, um, it's really progressed a long way from that to becoming a full, in the university sense, center where we work. We have now uh, 25 people in our group. It's a multidisciplinary group. Uh, we have uh, basic scientists. Uh, we have um, clinicians. And we work with uh, people in rheumatology, anesthesiology, uh, family mm -hmm. medicine, as well as in a number of the basic uh, preclinical departments. So it's very much part of the culture uh, that exists now. And I just thought I'd briefly tell you about the three divisions that we have, and then we get on to the acupuncture and pain uh, uh, review. But we have a clinic. Uh, we treat in our clinic um, patients mainly with uh, pain problems. And we chose pain for many reasons. Because of what I said before, I, I couldn't understand everything. But the fact that pain is one of the commonest problems that we have it's one that we don't deal well with in conventional medicine, and partly because we're focused mainly on the lesion, on the physical disorder, but it's much more of a biopsychosocial problem. It's more the perception and the experience of pain that's really important and something that you can do something about. And it's one of the costliest problems that we have in medicine today. Um, so we focused in, in that area. We have uh, people using both conventional treatments and complementary therapies working together. And that's quite interesting to see uh, what happens. When we started in 91, we were really, what I would say, is the tail of the dog. It was a, a tertiary care university hospital, so they would get the last cases, the last resort cases, into this pain center. And then after they had tried all their blocks, all their medications, all the therapies they could think of, then they said, oh, let's see what Berman and his group can do. And we started to 
And but that actually took, before they even say that, that took four months. In the first four months, basically nothing was happening as far as any interaction. And then the, uh, the director of the pain center came in one day with a, an acute torticollis there at the computer. And he had a viral infection. And he said, he's like this. I said, well, come on into my room. And I gave him two points in his ear, ear acupuncture, and immediately had full range of motion. And he looked at me and he sort of backed away, didn't say anything. And then that week, we started to get lots of referrals saying that Dr. Milholland is now a big believer in acupuncture. It wasn't because of all the studies, it was only because of his own study uh, on, on himself that had changed things. And then what they, we found over the years is that we became, instead of the last resort, we started to see results and then it became, well, let's try some of these less invasive therapies first, and then if things don't work, we can go on to some of the techniques that we normally use, and, and that's how things have progressed. And the clinic is, is very important. One, for opening up more therapeutic options for the patients and for also clinical research, but most importantly for breaking down uh, some of those barriers that we found. The second part of the uh, program is to do with education, and we have a number of educational activities. Uh, and this is now, I think, a half of the medical schools in the United States, so about 64 of the 125 medical schools have some sort of a course uh, overall in complementary medicine. Usually it's a, a few hours and it can range up to a, a month. And what we've developed is a, uh, a course in each four years. The fourth year in particular is one that uh, I took some advice from Michael Smith. Is, is Michael here? <laughs> but at the uh, education and the uh, experiential side. And, and what we've done is any exposure to this uh, up until now. And we have therapies that history helped with um, meditations, going to the clinics, um, therapy, um, <coughs> learning tincture, so it becomes more alive for them. Same thing in the first year, it now becomes a part of the required curriculum um, for a couple of days, which is uh, a big change in, in our country. I'd be interested to hear what, what is happening here, if, if, if people know what's going on in the medical school um, at this point. We always look to Europe as what's going on, and then when I get here, I realize people also look to both sides. I think that would be, it's like two ships passing in the night, so I think we can learn a lot from each other. The other part of the education is a fellowship program, so that's something that's open to anybody, and our fellowship program is more to do with research. Um, we have people who can come, uh, let's say medical doctors, who don't really know about clinical research, and then they link in with our Department of Epidemiology, who has a one-year program to teach clinical research methods. And part of that is then learning about complementary therapies, the philosophy, the, the uses, the background. And then they focus a research project on some area of complementary medicine. The other side of the fellowship is if somebody has a research background, so a PhD in physiology, we have a couple who have come and they don't need to be taught about research, but they need to focus their efforts on complementary medicine and make it relevant to the, uh, the therapies that they're looking at. So there's different activities like that. There's a, a visiting professor series, seminar series open to the universities, activities. And then the final part is research, and that's been the main part of our efforts. Um, you know, they have a saying in medicine, in God we trust. Everyone else must show data. So the field of complementary medicine, it really holds true. You know, what we need is it, uh, to be some, some solid evidence. We know, many people know how they get results in practice, uh, but there's a big gap uh, uh, between that and the scientific community. And I think part of that has to come from uh, evidence driving that way. To do that, we have found that you need a collaborative effort. You need to work together with the um, people who know science, work with the statisticians and methodologists, together with the people who know about the complementary therapies that we're uh, choosing, acupuncture, and then with the people who know about the disease that we're studying. And that kind of collaborative effort means that you really get something that works. When we first started, it wasn't that way at all. I would sit down with the chairman of epidemiology, and he would tell me how clinical trials were done, and then we would come along with complementary medicine, and the studies were really not very relevant, and it takes time to develop that kind of a team. So the, for us, the types of research that we're involved with um, are, are many. One, one is uh, database evaluation. Um, 
one of the first things that people will say is that there's no evidence in this field. So we developed a, a database for pain and complementary medicine. And that uh, database we call Complementary Alternative Medicine CAM, pain campaign database, has about 10,000 citations in it. So we can say, at least in the area of pain, that there is evidence that exists. Um, but there is evidence that exists. And then we do systematic reviews of literature in the different areas with that. So we do one now with uh, Klaus Lind, uh, Dieter Malkart at uh, Munich. And we do um, one that I will show you uh, shortly about acupuncture and pain. And then one with the Cochrane collaboration with osteoarthritis. So all, all in acupuncture there, we have other systematic re reviews ongoing. And then our work we, with the Cochrane collaboration, I don't know, are you familiar with the Cochrane collaboration? Or people know what it is? Um, it's an international group that was started in England in 1993 and it's really spread like uh, wildfire. Um, it, it's to do with bringing together the best evidence in medicine that exists, um, in particularly randomized controlled trials and controlled clinical trials in all areas of medicine. They have on the library, which people can access, something like 150,000 uh, randomized controlled trials that exist. And then people then say, well, this is my area of interest. I want to get involved and in doing a systematic review in that particular area. And they have people that can help others to get involved with that, um, to summarize the information so that people won't keep on repeating the same mistakes that others have made. They'll know what's going on out there. You have one sort of summary paper instead of having a hundred papers to look through. And there is one in pain that's, that's been formed recently. And um, that, that is a very important organization. Um, there is the reviews coordinator for that is Klaus Lind in, in Munich, and, and people can get, get in touch with him if they want to get involved through the field of complementary medicine. For us, then, the other part is, the main part is about clinical trials. And we have been doing clinical trials mainly in two areas. One to do with acupuncture, and one to do with uh, what we call mind-body therapy. Um, in acupuncture, we have been involved with both acute pain studies and chronic pain studies. In acute pain, it has been with uh, post-operative dental pain. And Dr. Lau has been the principal investigator on these types of studies. And what we did starting in 1992 was we, we took sort of the, the first step of a pilot test. We wanted to see was acupuncture helpful for patients who had undergone third molar extraction. It's a very standard uh, model that's used in the drug industry, and we wanted to see if we could use that kind of a model for acupuncture. And we found that we could, that we could reduce the pain, the intensity, and the duration that they had pain in a pilot study of 10 patients. And then we went on to uh, look at that and say, could we do a randomized controlled trial and develop a placebo model for that in a larger study, which we have done. Uh, we just submitted that to JAMA, uh, that was with 40 patients, and then we were doing it with two sites of 80 patients with UCLA. And there we developed a placebo model for acupuncture in acute pain. And the idea being that some patients would get real acupuncture, local points and, and distal points. And then the other group would get placebo <coughs> acupuncture. And in this case, what we did was we tapped a guide to real ones would get the needles going through, and the placebo ones, there was no needles going through. They would just have the tapping over the areas. And then that would be connected up to an electrical stimulation unit for both, side, for both groups that wasn't working. So it was more to, to sort of see what they thought was, was happening. And then we asked, we took the uh, questionnaire that a uh, fellow in England, Vincent, had developed, and asked some further questions to see what was their attitudes and their experience. And what do they think that they really got, real acupuncture or, or something else? Uh, they couldn't tell the difference, so the model seemed to work. And it did show um, that it was effective for reducing the pain of post-operative uh, dental extractions. We now, in, in a few days' time, are going to present a, a study that we think will follow on from that, which has a much larger group of patients and, and several hundred patients um, comparing um, those different arms and one other arm that we will uh, bring into that. So it's sort of a, you see the sort of stepwise progression um, that it takes, and it takes a lot of time, which is probably why there isn't that much uh, research in the field.
field. The other area was in osteoarthritis, B syndrome. Osteoarthritis is one of the, the, you know, the biggest problems that the elderly face. It's one of the costliest ones, and the treatments that we have often um, cause more side effects than, than are helpful. And so we thought this was an area where we wanted to see if acupuncture could be added to standard care. Not is acupuncture a placebo effect, but is acupuncture placebo?